Okay, yo. Okay. So as we were, there was, we were saying about how the reason why we have this prophecy and why Jesus is coming back is because Satan has always wanted to be worshipped as God and be God. Um, in Isaiah 14, 13, 14, it talks about the war in heaven in which Lucifer, who was one of the three main archangels, was the one that wanted to be worshipped as God and how he tried to usurp the authority of God by going against God in heaven and how he was thrown down like lightning from the sky and Jesus witnesses in the book of Matthew he says that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven and uh, if you remember as one of the three archangels Lucifer was in charge of the worship in heaven Lucifer's main role in heaven was to lead the angels and to lead all in the worship of God so music and worship was his specialty. Michael, the other archangel, is in charge of the angelic armies. He's, he's the battle. He's the military angel. He's the one that does the fighting. Gabriel, the other uh, archangel, is the diplomat. He's the one that is, sends messages. He's the one that told Mary about the virgin birth of Christ. Coming in. Uh, Gabriel was seen talking to Daniel about the 70 weeks and the seal of the scroll of the prophecy. So Danny was very much a part of this on how in the war of worship over heaven how how Satan was the one that tried to usurp and take over the kingdom of God. Last week we studied examples in Genesis about Cain and Abel in which the first murder in the Bible occurred in which Cain killed Abel. And the reason that Cain killed Abel was over jealousy of the, of the sacrifice. You remember Cain offered grain sacrifice, the first fruits of the ground, while Abel offered the firstling of the flock, blood. God received Abel's sacrifice because God was pleased with the blood sacrifice. And that was a preview of Jesus being the Lamb of God who shed his blood on the cross for our sins. I mean, Christ himself was died for our sins, was sacrificed for our sins. And if you remember in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, it talks about how God questioned Cain about Abel, and then the famous line that we all know, Cain answered God by saying, Am I my brother's keeper? And of course God says, Yes, you are your brother's keeper. See, God knew what happened to Abel. God sees and knows everything. He just wanted Cain to confess and to repent of his sin. But instead of repenting of his sin, Cain was steadfast and stubborn and rejected God's plea. So God banished him, and where his, his line would be the rejected line. And that's where the Edomites come from. And then we studied also Daniel chapter 3 of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego last week of the worship of, of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. The interesting thing there is that, again, music was involved in that as well. At the, at the, when the trumpets and the cymbals and the drums all sounded in the playing, at that time of Nebuchadnezzar, they were all to worship and bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And of course, the three young Jewish teenagers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused, saying that they only worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Upon that, Nebuchadnezzar was so wrathful and so full of hatred toward them is that he raised the fiery furnace ten times hotter. And when people, when the when the guards through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace, they died, throwing them into the fire, except for the three Jewish teenagers. And if you remember in Daniel chapter 3, the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar saw the fourth one, and he had the image like the Son of God. So he saw Jesus, and that was Jesus in the fiery furnace. Jesus was actually with them and protecting them, communing with them, comforting them during that time. So when you look at that, when you take all that contrast, Nebuchadnezzar represents what Satan desires, since that's the worship of people. Satan has always desired your worship, your time, your affection, your love. And that's what worship involves. When you worship God, you worship God out of love, you worship God out of commitment, you worship God out of adoration. You worship God because that is what we will do in heaven as well. We will worship God for eternity. And worship is a part of submission. Worship is part of how you relate to God. Worship is 
part of your relationship with God, how you worship God. You can worship Him publicly with, with the church, and you can worship Him privately through the choices you make, through the decisions that you're committed to, and by the life that you live. Amen? The way that you worship God personally is just as important as you worship God publicly. Your life is a reflection of your worship and love to God. The way you live is a reflection and a testimony in how much you love God. And when you see how Satan goes to all, I mean, he turns over every stone to try to get your worship. Satan not only wants your attention, he wants your money, he wants your body, he wants your mind, he wants your heart, and eventually he wants your soul. And Satan will start off by saying, look, I, I, you know, Satan will appease you and give you something that you like, something that you're attracted to. And then he takes that something or someone and makes it bigger where it entrances you. It takes your attention. Once that happens is that once Satan has your attention, and that's not hard to do. Let's be honest. It's not hard for Satan to get our attention. Let's be real about this. I think many people like to say they're Christian and they're strong but we're weak we're weak morally we are weak spiritually how many of us and you got to be honest with yourself how many of us if we were in Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego's shoes how many of us would have told the king we will not worship your statue how many of us would have rejected the law of the land at that time how many of us, knowing full well that if we don't do this, that we will die, or that we would face death, we would still stand for Jesus and say, we stand for Jesus, we will not do this thing. How many of us would do that? Now, many people say they would, but I don't think 90% of those 100%, 100 of people who say they would, 90 of the 100% would back down. We would compromise and we would chicken out for lack of a better word phraseology we would back down and we would compromise and that's what's happening in today's Christianity we have very few Shadrach Meshach and Abednego's out there we have very few Daniels out there we have very few Mary's out there we have very few committed and passionate believers of Jesus Christ Matthew chapter 23 I'll give you a great example Jesus when he affronted the Pharisees he called them Liars, root of vipers, hypocrites, very strong language. Preacher came out on TV and said, and he made a good point and I agree with him. Amen to this. He said many of today's false Christians would have considered Jesus very judgmental. Can you imagine accusing Jesus of being judgmental? And not only accusing Jesus of being judgmental, they go a step further and said people would not friend him. They would unfriend him if he was on Facebook. They would stop hanging around him. They would stop following him because he was deemed too judgmental and controversial. And I believe in my heart that if Jesus Christ was walking this earth right now, he would be just as hated now as he was back then. Because again, the devil rules this world. He wants to be worshipped and he uses anything from socialism, communism, atheism, any ism that you can think of to go against the Bible and God's word to attract people's attention and to enslave them in his traps. If you look on the board, we talked about traps last week. How the word temptation, the word temptation means thrapos. It means trap. When you're tempted, you're trying to trap, being a trap. There are three ways to fight temptation. The first way is through prayer. You need to pray every day. You need to be in constant relationship with your God through prayer. You need to pray in the name of Jesus, Yeshua. You need to pray for God's power. Fasting, we need to fast. Fasting is done not only to cleanse the body, but to cleanse your soul, to, cl to cleanse your, to your mental state and your emotional state, to be ready to prepare for God's will. The Word of God, you have to know this Word. You have to know this book right here. Uh, and I will tell you, Christians out there, you need to invest your time in studying this book. This is God's Word. You need to invest your time in not only knowing it, but studying it. Really get into it. Really know God's word. Know the verses. Know what God. Know what Jesus said about the rapture and prophecy and so on. He, I mean, He tells you right here in His, in his word what's going to happen before it happens. We have to know God's word. 
And the reason we have so many heresies today and why so many people are falling away from the truth of God is that they don't know His Word. If you don't know God's Word, how are you going to know God's will for your life? People ask me all the time when they do ask, Pete, what is God's will for my life? Well, He tells you in His Word what it is. God tells you right up here. God's will for your life is to submit to Him, to repent of your sins, and to follow Him. That's the greatest will that He has for you. That His greatest will is that none should perish and that all should come to repentance and follow Jesus. That's God's greatest will for your life. The, the war over worship is going to take a dramatic turn because now, as we face September, which in the Jewish calendar is the beginning of the seven-year cycle of Shemitah, I'm pronouncing it right, those are the, the seven years which things will happen according to God's word. Prophecy is going to be fulfilled in those seven years. It's very interesting how you start off in those seven years that the United Nations is going to adopt a policy by all nations of the world, all nations are going to follow this, in which eventually it's going to lead to a one world government, a one world economy. What is going to happen is, is that all the banks of the world will gather all their assets and have a one currency. That's the worst idea of all time. Okay? Because if you try to if you try to categorize your currency, all the money, into one thing, one thing, who's going to control that currency, right? Who's going to be the leader that's going to control all the economies of the world? Who's going to be the person that's going to control the input and output of your money? Who's going to pay you? How you who's going to pay for your, your paycheck? Who's going to watch over this? This is setting up for the Antichrist. This is setting up, everything is getting into place for the Antichrist. Here's some things that are going on in this country that you need to understand. There is a movement in our country and has been going on for the last 30 years and even longer in which they're trying to do away with the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The Second Amendment has been under attack. The First Amendment has been under attack. The freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the right to bear arms are the three main things that are being under attack right now. There was a ruling in the case in Colorado of the, of the couple, Christian couple who refused to bake a cake for a gay couple, if I remember correctly. Well, the court came back and said that they had to, by law, bake that cake because they, it, it, listen to this, this is what's going to grab you. Their religion was causing discrimination against that couple. And because that religion was causing discrimination against that couple, it's unconstitutional. Okay. All those big words, here's what it basically said. The court said this, Your faith in your God does not come before the rights of people. Are you listening out there? Your God, His laws, come second, and our laws come first. Okay. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? The law of the land at that time was this. When you hear the music by King Nebuchadnezzar and his orchestra, you are to fall down on your feet and your hands and worship the statue. That was the law of the land. If you did not worship this statue in Daniel chapter 3, you were thrown into the fiery furnace, right? That was the law of the land. My question to you is this. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we are to respect and follow the laws of this land. Yes. But if those laws interfere with the Word of God, do we still do we still follow the laws of this land even if it goes against what this book says, what God's Word says? Yes or no? No. We as Christians follow God's Word first and foremost. Whatever God has said, we will follow. Remember what Jesus told His first disciples? What were the two words he said? Follow me. He didn't say follow Pharaoh. He didn't say follow Caesar. He didn't say follow Rome. What did he say? Follow me. If you're in a position where you have to compromise your faith in God to, in order to obey a man-made law, let me encourage you to follow God's word. I'm going to follow God's word. Okay. I'm going to follow my true king, my true boss. I have bosses at work. But they're not my true boss. Do you understand what, that, what I'm saying? My boss sits on the throne. Amen? 
I follow his word and his will. Let's, let's go another, let me put some conjecture into this. I'm going to use some big words. I don't want to use ghetto language here. I have been in relationship with my God for 30 years. What does that mean? That means that I have been in the ministry for 30 years. Now think about that for a minute. Relationships don't last 30 years, right? Cars don't last 30 years, right? Not even marriages last 30 years nowadays. It's very rare. People don't even make it to the age of 30, right? That's a milestone. How is your relationship with God? Your relationship with God should be the most sustaining, should be the most passionate and the first relationship in your life. All other relationships don't matter. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, nothing else matters, right? But yet, as Christians, I don't find that anymore. I find that Jesus' relationship is in competition with relationship with other people, other things, and it should not be that way. Jesus should come first and foremost. You should follow His Word, His will. And if you don't follow Jesus in His Word and His will, what does it say in John chapter 15? He said this, If you love me, obey my commandments. Amen? He said that. Does that make Jesus radical? Yes. It's His way or no way. Do you understand? When He said He was the way and the truth and the life, what was He really saying? He was saying that He's the only door to heaven. He's the only way to God. Amen? He's the only one that gives eternal life. He's it. There's no one else. There's nothing else. It's only Jesus. And see, that's what the devil cannot stand. The devil wants you to have other avenues. He wants you to have choices. He wants you to have options. Well, we're going to look at some examples in the Bible now of what happens when you make a wrong choice. You know, I hear people saying it's their choice. Like it, they make a choice and then nothing's going to happen, everything's going to be fine. In Joshua chapter 7, I'm going to show you an example of a man and his family. He made a bad choice against God. And that choice cost him his life. Now folks, before you get up and say, what kind of God does this? It's a righteous God, amen, a just God, and a fair God. The way that God deals with us is the way we should deal with each other. We should be fair, we should be equal. Do you understand what that means? That means you should treat people fairly. They Respect should be given, not to certain people that you love. You should respect people, period. Amen? And when that lack of respect comes, it infuriates some people. If you don't respect God, do you think God's going to be happy? If you don't respect Jesus Christ, do you think He's going to just say, oh, okay, and, and let you get away with it? Does God let you get away with anything, yes or no? So what makes you think, why even try to get away with, with it from God, right? Well, here is Achan. Achan did a very foolish thing. And boy, this happens to all of us. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. Joshua chapter 7 talks about Jericho being destroyed. You remember how the walls of Jericho came down? They marched around it seven times, right? And on the seventh time, they blew their trumpets and they yelled and praised God. And the walls of Jericho came down. We're not talking about little fences here. We're talking about thick, big walls like the, like the Great Wall of China. We're talking about those kind of walls, thick and high walls. The walls came down. The nation of Israel went in and defeated the Jericho army. Now, before you say what's the big deal about that, the Jericho army was a big, bad army. This army was big, it had weapons. This was an army that beat other nations. When the nation of Israel, when the walls came down, and who do you think brought the walls down? God. When the walls came down, the nation of Israel invaded Jericho and took over the city. And they kill their enemies. It says here in Joshua chapter 7. Whew. 
You ready for this? But the children of Israel, verse 1, committed a trespass and a cursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, wow, he's from the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Achan took something that belonged to God. Now, before you, before you ask this question, what belongs to God? What do I take that belongs to God? Remember this. The life that you live, the time that God gives you on this planet is a gift from God. If God gives you 80 years, you better make sure in those 80 years you serve and know God. Amen? You know your Creator. If God has given you a second chance in life, in other words, you've had a disease or anything and God has healed you, that is God's way of blessing you to serve Him longer. For you people out there that are getting off and think that it's because of your genetics, your family history, because of the medicine of, of a man that you're living a longer life, don't kid yourselves. It's God that's given you a longer life. Amen? And God has given you a longer life for the very reason is to know Him and to repent of your sins and to know Him. And if you are a believer, He wants you to continue to have a relationship with Him. God does not give us anything for ourselves. He gives us things to worship Him. Do you understand that? If God has given you the ability to sing, He wants you to use that to worship Him. <clears throat> if God has given you athletic talents, he wants you to use those talents to worship Him. If God has given you excess of money, He wants you to use that money to worship Him and to help others. God has never given you anything to use for yourself. That's selfish. Do you understand? I can name you a list of people that would sing for church choirs, that would sing for the Lord, then they got ambitious and selfish and wanted to sing for themselves. And their lives were never the same. Why? Because they went against God's will. And when you go against God's will, God does not bless what you do. God will not bless your marriage. God's not going to bless your job. God is not going to bless anything you say and do apart from His will. I don't care what your mother says, or your father, or your grandpa, or your pope, or your sheriff, or whoever, your BFF. God is not going to bless you for doing wrong. God is not going to bless you for selfishness. That's what happened with Achan. Achan did something that was against God's will and against God's word. And in there, and in that, it didn't only cost him, but it cost his family. You have to remember, we worship God. We don't worship a genie. Do you understand what that means? That means we live by God's will. We don't go to God with our wishes and desires and say, I want to do this, 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 and rub his belly and hope the wishes come out. God's not a genie. God will listen to your prayers, and if it goes with align with his will, then he'll answer them. But if it's not in his will, he's not going to answer it. If I told God I want to be a heart doctor, he'll look and say, no, son, that's not what I have planned for you. You're going to be a preacher. But I don't want to be a preacher. Let me see, son. Uh, let me look here. I really don't care what you want. Amen? <laughs> he told Jeremiah, before you're even born, you're going to be a prophet to the nations. And what did Jeremiah do? He was a prophet. What about Jonah? Jonah actually said no to God. You know, there, there are things that you cannot say to God. Do you understand? You cannot blaspheme His name. You cannot curse His name. And the one thing you never do to God is you don't say no to Him. If you say no to God, you're hurting yourself. Just ask Jonah. God prepared a special fish to swallow him up for three days and three nights. And in those three days and three nights, God commune with him. God spoke to him. And God reminded him, listen Jonah, you're my prophet. I'm sending you to Nineveh and you're going to preach the word. It's real simple. God did not beg him. God did not plead with him. God did not say pretty please with sugar and spice on top. He didn't do that. He says, 
I'm God, your servant. You go there, and this is what you do. Amen? Amen. Nowadays, that's considered abuse. Nowadays, that's considered harsh. Folks, we are weak. Do you understand? If, if we were in, in the Christian army of God, all of us would have to go through basic training again just to be tough to serve God. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Let's look what the dummy did. Here's what the dummy did. Whew. Okay, dummy, what did you do? Verse 14 in Joshua 7, 14. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought up according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe that the Lord hath taken shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take of thy households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come one man by man. Achan took silver, gold, and artifacts from Jericho. They were supposed to be used for the, in the worship of God. So he was literally taking things that were meant for the worship of God for himself. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. I've been very nice so far. I've been nice. So now I get a little mean here. To so all these mega pastors and mega churches, do you think all the millions of dollars that come, you don't think that that money could be used to help people in your church? People with cancer that need money to help defray cost of cancer. Maybe people in your church, some have lost a job and they're faithful to you and they're faithful to God. You don't think you could help them out until they find another job financially? Am I making sense? Or am I stupid? Have you used that money to help young teenage mothers that made a mistake and instead of the easy way out with abortion, maybe you help them financially through adoption or maybe even care for the baby? Have you ever thought of that? Do you actually do that? Do you support other nations, other churches across the, not only in the world, but in the United States that are really doing God's work? Maybe they're pastors, they, they want to do God's work, but they're having a job and they can't go out and, and do full-time ministry because they got to work to support their family. Have you ever thought maybe to help them and give them, just to, just to give them a push so they can continue doing God's work? I know a lot of pastors that have quit pastoring because they can't pastor and have a, have a full-time church. It doesn't work. We're not asking for a million dollars. We're just asking maybe help to pay the electric bill, gas for the car, or food. Do you understand? Have you used your money to worship God in that way? Or do you use the money for yourself selfishly? Do you use the money for lavish things to buy for yourself and your family? Do you use the money lavishly to buy limousines and planes and cars for yourself? Is that God honoring? Did God give you that money for yourself? Yes or no? That's stealing. You're stealing from God. You're stealing from God's ministry and not only to help other people that need it, but you're helping yourself to it. There are a lot of people in this country that work and work hard. There's not, it's not a sin to work hard. It's a sin not to get paid for working hard. Amen? Amen. It's a sin not to get paid for what you put into it. It's a sin for people to work 10 to 12 hours and get paid minimum wage. Do you understand that? That's a sin. People depend on those jobs not only to pay their bills but to actually eat and have a life. And you wonder why people don't want to go to work. Because they get screwed every time. They try to do things the right way and they get screwed because it doesn't work out. They work their butts off and they see someone get free phones, free meals, free everything. And they're capable of working, but they choose not to. Because why work when it's free, right? Why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free, so to speak? 